So I'm going to share with you a message today entitled, How to Counter Falsehoods, okay? How to Counter Falsehoods. Oops, sorry. Okay. This is not what I would like to speak on. Huh? This is not my favorite topic, understand? One of the good things about uh, uh, looking at the Word of God and study what we call expository preaching is that you have no choice. But when it comes to that passage or that chapter, you have to look at it, right? So, so unlike uh, topical preaching, where you actually preach your hobby horse, what I call your favorite topic all the time, and, and that, that, that's not difficult to do. Huh? But when it comes to studying the book of the Bible, book by book every year, uh, you have to preach whatever is in, the, in that passage. The good news is you get to go through the whole Bible, right? Uh, not so good news is you have to be faithful to the text. But today, in Deuteronomy 13, this entire passage is about falsehoods. Wow. And if you look at the chapter, it is divided, in my opinion, in my analysis, into three expanding circles of falsehoods. From verse 1 to verse 5, false prophets. From verse 6 to verse 11, false families, false friends, the company you keep. And then from verse 12 to verse 18, he talks about the town, false culture in ever-expanding circles of influence. So what the God is saying in Deuteronomy through Moses is very applicable to us today. Everybody say false prophets, false friends, false culture in ever-expanding circles. But I'm going to focus only on false prophets. The first five verses of chapter 13 of Deuteronomy because the principles are the same. So let me read from verse 1 to verse 5. If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a miraculous sign or wonder, and if the sign or the wonder of which he has spoken takes place, in other words, it came to pass. And he says, let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them. God says, you must not listen to him, even though he works signs and wonders. The Lord your God is actually testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow and him you must revere, keep his commandments, and obey him, serve him, and hold fast to him. That prophet or dreamer, olden days are not now, uh, must be put to death. That's how serious God is, you know. Exactly, wow. Because he preached rebellion against the Lord your God and who brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. He has tried to turn you from the way the Lord your God commanded you to follow. You must purge the evil from among you. How do we counter falsehood? Let me begin with a story that happened in the UK. How a youth pastor came to this church in the outskirts of UK. 
And after a while, he got the confidence of the young people because he began to win the hearts of the young people over to him because he talks about uh, 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 things that, that matter to young people. He was a wonderful, probably one of the best youth pastors in the UK. Talked about TikTok, talk tick, whatever it is. <laughs> talked about social media, talked about LGBTQ, QIA, LGBTQIA, talked about tattooing, talked about all kinds of things. And of course, uh, one day he said to his group, the best way to understand LBG, LB, I can't even pronounce it, no. L, LGBTQIA, that's right, uh, is to actually visit a gay club. Of course, some parents won't allow, but those came, they came, and, and, and they went to a gay club. And one father was very suspicious, so followed the group. And as he entered the gay club with these young people, Hi, Bob, how are you? Bob is his name. Hi, Bob, how are you? Like, everybody give him a hug, you know. Hi, Bob, you remember last week you had a meeting? Yes, yes. Remember, thank you, Bob, for taking me for lunch. Thank you, Bob. Hey, Bob, you know that thing? No? And suddenly the father realized something is not right. And he asked around, Bob is the secretary of that gay club. And he was leading the sheep to the slaughter. Instead of praying for young people, P-R-A-Y, he was praying on the young people, P-R-E-Y. Outside looks so good, oh? but inside rotten to the core. And this is what I'm going to share with you today from Deuteronomy 13. How do we spot falsehood? Because it's very insidious, very subtle. The Apostle Paul, when he said farewell to the Ephesians, Chris, uh, Ephesian elders at Miletus, said this. It is farewell message to them because it's the last time the elders would see him. He said, I know that after I leave in Acts chapter 20, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. In other words, they are wolves in sheep's clothing. Heard of it? Wolves in sheep's clothing. Even from your own number, from among you. Wow, that's why it is so subtle, you see. If you come from outside, we can, we can spot them, but it's within you. Men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So, S-I-B-K-L, be on your guard. So everybody say, be on my guard. Everybody say, talk front to back, left to right, top to bottom. Everybody say loud, be on my guard. On One more time, be on my guard. Even Jesus himself said, in the last days, at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate one another and many false prophets will come and deceive many people. And he goes on to say, even the elect will be deceived. Be on your guard. How, uh, pastor? How? How do we counter falsehoods? So I'm going to deal with it in two subcategories. Number one, how do we distinguish the false? You know, in a bank, you must distinguish the false, right? In order to value the, tr the authentic, the genuine. So how do we distinguish the false and then is a remove and replace principle? How then do we keep ourselves in the way of the truth? If I were to put it in another way, how do we spot the false and how do we sustain ourselves in the way of the truth? So let me first of all tell all of us, how do we spot 
the false. Thank God for Deuteronomy 13, oh. Isn't it amazing? I, I would not have deal with this topic, right, if not with Deuteronomy 13. Praise, come on, thank, come on, let's give God a clap offering. Shall we do that? Thank God for Deuteronomy 13, amen. So when I studied, the, hey man, goodness, it's amazing, right? So let's look at it. How do we spot the false? Three ways, according to this passage. Number one. There are three features of the false. Now, hear me, hear me very well. The first feature, according to this passage, is false prophets, false preachers, false men of God will eventually, they start well, lead you to follow other gods. But you say, Pastor, hey, I'm not like that. I will not follow other gods, right? Because I will not bow to idols. So I put other gods as you. Lah. People like that, they start off well to speak for God. They end up speaking as God. Happened many times. And therefore, the word of God says, if a prophet or one who foretells by dreams, a foreteller of dreams, you know, God spoke to me, you know, wow, serious. And then wonderful visions, but actually God never spoke. And even if he announces to you miraculous sign, and even if that sign in one that took place, Wow, everybody follow after him. Hero worship him, you know. Be careful. Be careful. You heard me say this um, many, many times. The best of men are still men at best. Don't follow after Pastor Chu. Huh? I'm still a man. I can fail you one, no. Don't follow any pastor. The best of men are still men at best. Follow God. The word, the word of God, I'm, I'm, I'm putting ahead of myself now. It's very, very important that we must understand this principle. The best of men are still men at best. Never hero worship a man. And I've seen this many times. The second feature is before long, they begin to utter things contrary to the word of God. That is the reason why we keep telling you, church, study his word. It is not the words of men, how eloquent they are, what kind of wonderful cliches they use. Anybody can come up with that. I can come up with that. No big deal. Just Google only, ma. But the word of God is eternal. When people tell me, especially young people nowadays, they follow after personalities rather than the word of God. Oh, yo. It brings out an amber light inside me. Bah, bah, bah. It's true or not? But it's true. It's actually right. Young people follow after heroes more than other things. Correct or not? It's true. That's why they have heroes, ma. But there's a danger, you see. If we continue along this trend, you can draw a crowd... But before long, you draw them away from God. You become their God. Before long, you end up being another Karl Lenz. Anyway, that is also not true. You know why? Because we did a survey, right? We did a survey, and this only applies to SIBKL young people. Not true. Our SIBKL young people love the Word of God. Amen. Let's give God a clap offering for 
It's true. We did a survey, you know. Huh? It's true, huh? not true. Because our young people love the Word of God. The only thing is the delivery style must be different. Huh? I don't know whether this one appeals to young people or not. Young people talk differently, you know, all the voice and the noise and so on and so forth. You know, they, 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 you, you, you communicate with them in the way they understand the lingo. But, it's, but it doesn't take the, away the message. Understand? The way you communicate the message could be different, but it does not take away the content. You have to lead them back to the Word. It's very, very important. And as I said, they begin by speaking for God. And before long, they end up speaking as God. And therefore, the third feature, they become arrogant. Very arrogant. The smacks of arrogance. Proud. Egocentric. Self-seeking. And it's very, very subtle. Many years ago, Pastor Lee Chu and I were very attracted to a preacher. We used to go to FGA at that time. SIBKL has not started yet. We just came back from, in, from uh, Vancouver. So we go to FGA in the morning, and then in the afternoon, at about 12, 30, 1 o'clock, we used to go to this place, especially to hear this speaker, who's so eloquent, do you know that he can just take the Bible, no notes, and preach the message from the Bible, quoting Habakkuk, Obadiah, la, just like that, no problem, no, for two to three hours until 3 p.m. And we will sit down, Google Gagai, salivating. Whoa, fantastic! And I was attracted. I used to get all here, that time is cassettes, you know. I used to get cassettes and play my cassette player, everything. Until, after a couple of years, it was revealed that during the last three to four years, he was having sex with an underage girl. Nobody knew. His adopted daughter. Adopted daughter. False prophet. I remember that he could take healing rallies. And I remember that he could literally say, hey, I see somebody wearing a yellow sari with a blue ribbon and, and the Lord is going to heal you of your cancer. Sure enough, no, this lady come out or no? I see a man with a blue polka dot dress, you know, with the striped trousers and you have got high blood pressure and sure enough, he come out or no? <laughs> Serious? How did he do it? And it works. But all the time, he was committing adultery with an underage girl. Be careful. Be careful. So Jesus says, in Matthew chapter 7, watch out for false prophets especially in the end days. They will come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Wolves in sheep's clothing, right? It could very well be that that idiom came from the Bible one, no? Could very well be because, you know what I mean? How old can you get from the Bible, you see? But, ah, this is the key. I'm coming now to how do you recognize, how do you sustain? By their fruit, you will recognize them. In other words, it's not what they do, how eloquent they are. It's the fruit. What fruit? Not winning souls. Huh? It's the character. It's the character. It's by their fruit you will recognize them. What fruit? The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Nine fruits. 
Has he got self-control? Is he gentle? Is he patient? By their fruits, you recognize them. It is not the eloquence. It is not how you personify yourself, how you protect yourself. No. By your fruits, the character. It's not even leading people so to, to, to Jesus Christ. Uh. You can be a soul winner and you still be immoral. It's character. By their fruits, you will recognize them. That's the end of the Sermon on the Mount. That's how Jesus Christ ends the Sermon on the Mount. How then do we sustain ourselves? The remove and the replace principle. I want to share with you what I call the five right things to do. The five rights. And how you and I need to sustain ourselves in the truth over the long haul. Uh, and I want to emphasize this because I, I'm not interested in you running, 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 running 100 meters, then pump out. No, it is a marathon. The key is, how do we sustain ourselves over the long haul? In other words, uh, no, Pastor Lee Chu and I take a discipleship course for leaders because after you become a leader, we, we keep you going on. Uh, we, so this is something that Pastor Lee Chu and I do over the years called the Timothy Program that Pastor Lee Chu and I very jealously guarded. One, no? we, 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 so far, uh, we have not delegated it to anybody. We do it ourselves for leaders who are who, who minimum must be a leader of, for, for at least two years or one year or something like that. So in this Timothy program, we tell the leaders, hey, leadership is a journey. It is not a destination. The very fact that you become a leader doesn't mean that I have arrived. No, it is only the beginning of a journey. It's a long journey. It is over the long haul. How then do we sustain ourselves over the long haul so that we are not distracted, we are not derailed, we are not hijacked? Well, don't listen to the dreamer, all right? Now, verse 4 is the key. Deuteronomy chapter 4, 13 verse 4 contains some of the five things I'm going to share with you. How you take hold of it, reflect on it, internalize it. All right. Even though it's not my favorite topic, I think today's message is very important, right? Yeah. It's not, I, won't, I won't choose to talk on this one, no. But I think maybe God is saying something to all of us. Verse 4, let me read. Why do we read? Can we read together? It's okay with you? All right, come. All of us, read it together, left to right, front to back, top to bottom, and online as well. All right, read it loud so that your neighbor can hear you. Shall we do that? Are you ready? Everybody? All right, let's shake this building. One, two, three. You must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love Him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow and Him you must revere. Keep His commands and obey Him. Serve Him and hold fast to Him. Number one. Five rights. We must have the right love. If you love God, you will not be led astray. If you and I truly love God or the right focus, wow, 
you will not be distracted. Amen? That's what it says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind. Look, this is the Shema, right? This is the greatest commandment, right? See, Scripture is a very consistent one. No? Don't you think so? You don't have to come up with new things, one, ma. all right? Most important thing is obey the revealed and don't worry about the concealed. Whatever has been revealed to you, obey it. Don't hold life looking for the concealed, 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 new revelation, no. Obey the revealed. And God will begin slowly reveal the concealed. So what has been revealed? Love the Lord your God. When you love the Lord your God with all your heart, you will not be led astray, right? Listen, if you love your wife, you will not be distracted by other girls. Ladies, agree with me or not? Yeah. yeah. Correct or not? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I said, right, yeah, 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 yeah. Correct or not? Better do it, I tell you. Uh. <laughs> you know, when you love your spouse, not to your wife, lah, you will not be distracted. Secondly, this is not found in Deuteronomy 13. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Genesis chapter 20. We do that. Let me, let me, I, I found this out only while well, I studied the word. Huh? Serious. You see, in, in, when I went to Bible school, they always tell us, always go back to the law of first mention, where the first time the Bible is mentioned, the word is mentioned, that's it, that's it, that's the key, that's the source, because don't, don't, don't get distracted. So the first time I found out that the word prophet is mentioned is actually in Genesis chapter 20, verse 7. When it says this, concerning Abraham, in his relationship with Abimelech regarding his wife, Sarah, all right? And this is what Abimelech said in chapter 20 of Genesis, verse 7, speaking about Sarah. Now return the man's wife, which is Abraham's wife, because he is a prophet. In other words, Abimelech saw something in Abraham that was so spiritual, he identified Abraham as a prophet. Return this man's wife because Abraham is a prophet and he will pray for you and you will live. In other words, the first role of a prophet is not to preach, it's to pray. Do you know that? No. We have distorted it. A prophet, what is the future? Tell me, tell me about, tell me about. No, there's false telling, predicting. The role of a prophet is not prediction. It is to pray. He's a prophet. He'll pray for you. So the second thing of how you and I can keep ourselves and sustain ourselves along the way of truth over the long haul is not only love the Lord your God with all your heart, and we will be tested in our love for Him. Understand? We will be tested. That's what he said. Secondly, a true prophet is a man of prayer. A true prophet is a man of prayer, not a man of preaching. No. You can preach good sermons, it doesn't make you a man of God. Believe me. Listen to me very carefully. Believe me. It's your life of intimacy with God that matters more. Your closet time is more important than the pulpit time. Can I repeat that? Your closet time is more important than the pulpit. You know, some time ago, ah, there was this senior pastor from Singapore. I connect with, with a few churches in Singapore. And he was telling me, you know, you know Pastor Chiu, ah, you know, I've received so many invitations to speak. That was before MCO. Ah. 
I received so many invitations to speak internationally uh, that I got no time to pray. Uh. My amber light came. You know why? Because at the back of my mind, I didn't tell him. I am thinking, Sir, if that is so, you are nothing more, nothing better than a professional preacher. Nothing more. If you have so many messages to preach, you don't have to pray, no time to pray, you are nothing more than plying your trade as a professional preacher. Give up. Oh, I didn't tell him that, okay? <laughs> a good friend. Maybe I should tell him more. <laughs> Don't do that. How do I know you're a man of God? I know one. I talk to you so I know. I sense it. There is something inside you that I know that has been crafted and fostered through hours of intimacy with God. And very discerning people can know it, man. And SIBKL is a very discerning church. Go agree or not? Yeah. Come on, let's give one a clap offering. Amen? They can spot a rat a mile away, or smell a rat, rather. They can smell a rat a mile away. So don't play, play, huh? Do you know Samuel uh, was a true prophet? Why? Uh? He's a man of prayer, right? He's been see, heard in the first Samuel. You know, you know his prayers is so powerful that every prayer that he makes is fulfilled one uh, before he falls to the ground. And he himself said, then all of Israel recognized Samuel as a man of, as a as a true prophet. Why? Because he says, God forbid somewhere in 1 Samuel that I should sin against the Lord by not praying for you. Can you imagine that? If he doesn't pray for you, he's sinning. How many men of God say that? You tell me. So the key is this. A true prophet and a man of God has a right prayer life. Number three. How do we keep ourselves in the way of truth over the long haul? So after recognizing and identifying the faults, we need now to keep ourselves in the truth. How do you do that? So we must have the right love. We must love the Lord. We must honor Him. We must revere, the word, the word revere Him. The word revere is standing all of Him, not as a footnote or an afterthought, understand? No. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Right prayer life, and we must have the right accountability group. Why? Because there's check and there's balance. You know, I fear, I'm very afraid of people uh, who, who literally come out of accountability groups and, and do things on their own with no accountability. One, you know. Who is your accountability? Nobody. No. No. Very dangerous. That is why I have this group that meets once every two months to keep me in check. You know, your senior pastor can fall one, no? So all these senior pastors of the Clang Valley, we meet every six weeks. Why, huh? For fellowship, yes. You know, we rubbish others, hey, you know, talk rubbish, you know. But more important, we ask each other, how's your prayer life? Tell me, what is the latest book you're reading? Wow. Don't play, play, oh. Have to give an account, huh? How's relationship with your wife? How's Pastor Lee Chu? Huh? They ask me one. Very important. 
you must have a group of people whom you can trust, who's not afraid to tell you off uh, and not butter you up and put you up on a pedestal. So, so important. We must have the right accountability group. That's why Deuteronomy chapter 13 talks about family and friends. Correct or not? What kind of a company you keep, right? And then in expanding circle, talks about the town, talks about the church, talks about the culture. You see, what kind of a company you keep? See, if, if, if we don't have a company of godly people around us, before long, we can detour one or no. Don't you think so? We, we, we can give, we can go astray one or no. So very important. It's very, very important that we have good accountability group. You know, many years ago, uh, not in this church, maybe, could he be here? I don't know whether or it could be uh, the other side. Um, a man came. You know, tall, I remember, I, I can't remember how looks like, I know he's tall, big size guy. He is a visitor, and after the service, he came to me. He says, Pastor, I am Pastor so and so from the US. I like the vibes here. I like the vibes here. You know. Oh, I said, You're a visitor. At that time, was, so I, I invited him to my room, my office, I know how you are. And so, so I don't do that nowadays, okay? So I talked to him, and guess what? I, I said, Can you go to my office and you wait? I've got something to talk. When I went there, he was sitting on my chair. Pastor, it's a good idea to be the senior pastor of this church, you know. I said, why are you doing that? I like this chair. <laughs> you know, very brash. Very... And I said to him, sir, what church do you come from? Huh? No church. I am a pastor of the Universal Church of God. Wow, I said, I'm very polite one. Uh. <laughs> I didn't kick him out, I should, right? I didn't. But that kind of person, nah. <laughs> I am a pastor of the universal church of God. I'm not accountable to anyone except God. Rubbish. You need a group of people tell you off in love. And that's what my group does to me. You know, at the end of the day, let me say this to you. It is still a spiritual exercise. You know, overarching everything I've shared with you today, it is not a formula. It is not a set of rules. No. It is really walking in the will of God, in the right things of God. Am I right? Those are the five rights. You know, you cannot compromise. Or, yeah, maybe this, maybe program. No. You know, at the end of the day, I've lived long enough to know if you're spiritual, you're spiritual. If you're not spiritual, you're not spiritual. That's all there is. You cannot fake it. You cannot be a phony. Because at the end of the day, the enemy will trap you, you know. The enemy will derail you. You cannot last the long haul. Am I right or not? Before long, you will fall. Believe me. Believe me. You know how many pastors in Singapore have fallen? You know how many pastors in Malaysia have fallen? Because they take shortcuts. The five rights. Do you really love the Lord or not? If you really love the Lord, you won't do this, right? You won't, you, won't, you won't be distracted by other, other concerns, right? If you love the Lord, you, you will have a prayer life, a proper prayer altar in your, in your heart to read the Word of God. And if you really love the God, you will have an accountability group, right? And if you really love the Lord, you will have the right posture of obedience. You will obey the Word. So every time when the word of God is preached from this pulpit, it is not another message. 
is God speaking to you? To me? If not, why bother? You know, I value the Word of God. You know, there's an entire psalm, Psalm 119, that is devoted to the Word of God. Now, read this with me. This is David. It's the longest psalm in the entire Bible. Now, read with me. Can you read with me? It's okay with you to read me. I'm still within my time, huh? please. Huh? I haven't finished 12.30 yet. Huh? Okay. Okay. So can, can, we, can we read this together with me? Is I okay with you? Again, left to right, front to back, top to bottom, those online as well. All right, let's read it, okay? So that the other church down the road can hear us, okay? You okay with you? All right, are you ready? Psalm 1, Psalm 119, not 9. Is it? No, Psalm 19, you're right. Psalm 19, verse 7 to 11. Psalm 119 is also uh, on the Word of God. But Psalm 19 is also the same. All right, let's read. Psalm 19, verse 7 to 11. Are you ready? Everybody, one, two, three. The law of the Lord is reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. All right. Give joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure. All together righteous. They are more precious than much more pure gold than honey from the comb. He shall serve the Lord in keeping them. Ordinances, la, commands, la, statutes, la, laws. La. Be warned. By keeping them, you are blessed. Amen? Come on, let's give God a good clap offering. When I say this to you, study the Word. Read the Word, because the Word will keep you right, not the words of man. Understand? Finally, very important. Now, forgive me for extrapolating, huh? But I thought, let me contemporarize this passage to the modern day. Not only must we have the right focus of the right love in order to keep ourselves from wandering astray or keep ourselves in the way of truth, not only must we have the right prayer life, right closet time, the right accountability group, the right posture of obedience or the Word of God is still paramount, we must have the right church. And unapologetically, SIBKL for you is the right church. <laughs> unapologetically. Where do I get this from? Deuteronomy chapter 12. You notice, let me, ah, it's all there. I got it. See? Deuteronomy chapter 4 to 7. You must not worship the Lord your God in their way, but you are to seek the place the Lord your God will choose. I talks about Jerusalem, but I believe that it's more than Jerusalem. I want to contemporarize it to talk about the place. It's a physical place. You must seek the place the Lord your God will choose from among all the tribes to put His name there for His dwelling. To that place you must go. Bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and your special to that place what you have vowed to give, your free will offerings and the firstborn of your herds and flocks, there in the presence of your God in that place, you and your families, kids, your children, your grandchildren shall eat spiritual food. Rejoice so that you go back happy, ma. You go back joyful, ma. You know what? In other words, before you come to church, you quarrel. After the church, you don't quarrel. All right? Rejoice in everything you put your hand to because the Lord your God has blessed you. So the fifth thing is you must go to the right church. And I want to believe that this church is the right church for you. You want to clap? Give God a good clap offering and believe it. You know, let me close by this final slide. 
What is the right church? This is the right church. It's all there. The right place, the right church for you is the place that God will choose for you. If after all this, Pastor, yeah, SIBKL, not the church, it's okay one. There are plenty of good churches around, okay? You're not the only one. God will choose for you. You know it. You know in your spirit that as you come here, there is feeding, there is peace, there is growth, there is discipleship, there is that you love, you like the vibes. The proper one, huh? You feel His presence. Do you think so? How many of you sense the presence of God here this morning? Go to the balcony. It's a place where you worship and bring your offerings. It's a place where your family will be spiritual, not only you. Huh? It's a place where they will be rejoicing and where the Lord bless you. This is the place. And how do you keep yourself from walking in the truth when you are in the right church? You know, many years ago, when we had membership, when it was still small, I used to interview uh, every new member one, you know. Now we can't do that, right? No, we had our DNA tea yesterday. I don't know how many came. 100 over, 200, I don't know. This is the second time we had, the first time we had 300 over, you know, new member, new people wanting to know about SIB, KL. Yesterday, we had another membership tea where you haven't, had, you haven't come to a membership tea, I encourage you, come. From there, you will hear our DNA, you will ask a lot of questions and, 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 and it was a wonderful yesterday. I wasn't there, but they, they recorded what I said. But the key is this. Many years ago, before you become a member, I interview you and Everyone I interview, I have only one question, only one question to ask you, and it's this. Ever since you came into SIBKL, have you grown to love Jesus more? Can I repeat the question? Ever since God has chosen this place for you, led you to SIBKL, I want to ask you over the last few months, over the last few years, compare yourself now and then. Have you grown to love Jesus more? If you have, say yes. yes. Louder. Yes. If you have, this is the right church. If you haven't, maybe not. Because the most important thing for us is never programs. It's the end of the day you love Jesus even more. Because our core values has always been and will always be Christ-centered, Bible-based, Spirit-powered. Everybody say Christ-centered, Bible-based, Spirit-powered. It will always be. Not man-centered, Christ-centered. The Bible will always be our point of reference. And we are never driven by man. We are driven by the Holy Spirit. Everybody say Christ-centered, Bible-based, Spirit-powered. If you really believe that, this is the right church for you. Let me close. I want all heads bowed, all eyes closed. I'm not going to call you to come forward. I sense in my spirit that this morning is a time of commitment. Not for a few, but for all of us here as well as online. And this applies to not only the visitors or the new people that came, but also to every one of you who has even been here ever since we started 30 years. Uh, 27 years ago. I want you, if you feel in your spirit that God has spoken to you or reminded you this morning of why we need to stay in the truth and why in this church you find sustenance and feeding and your commitment is here, I want you to stand. Whether you've been here for 20 years, 30 years, whether you're a leader, whether you're a pastor, you stand. And let's stand together before God 
You can stand now if you want. I'm not asking anyone, everyone to stand. Huh? By standing, I want to pray a prayer of unity and unison. That together, those of you who are online, obviously you can stand or you can just raise your hands. By standing in the balcony as well. By standing, you say to me, you encourage me, you encourage one another. Yes. This is where I want to be. And I want to stay in the way of the truth. I want to love the Lord more. I want to feed on His Word even more. I want this church to be my accountability partners. I want myself not to police me, but to make sure I walk in the ways of God. I want to obey the Lord by standing, you're saying to me, and to God, yes, Lord. I want not only to hear the message every week, but I go back, I put it into practice. When you stand, you're telling God that I'm going to do that. So it doesn't matter if you don't stand. It doesn't matter to me, understand? You're standing to God. By standing, you say to God, yes, God, I want to commit myself to the eternal word of God. That's why you stand. And I want to stand because in a way, I'm committed to the future of this church. You stand. Let me pray. Those of you at home, you can raise your hands. Father, in Jesus' name, I see so many people standing. Almost 80, 90%. I thank you. I thank you, God, that you have brought all of us here. Whether in the last 27 years, or whether in be the last two or three weeks, I don't know. But all I do know, Lord, is that you have congregated us, yeah. Congregated us for reasons known to yourself in this season of our life. So that we can be together. So that we can be united in one cause. And the cause is never a church. The cause is the cause of the kingdom. The cause is the cause of Jesus Christ. I want to thank you for everyone here who is standing in your presence and those at home who are laying up their hands. Families are doing that in the house. I want to pray a blessing upon you and, and for all of us that even as we grow together, even as we journey together, it's a long journey. It's, 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 it's a long journey, understand? We will keep an eye on one another in love so that all of us will finish well. So Father, I want to pray a blessing about all the families represented here so that not only we, but our children and our grandchildren will grow in a godly environment. Don't you want it? So that the God, goodness of God is passed down from generation to generation. We are committed, Lord. We are committed to Jesus Christ. No other person but to Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Father. As Father awesome. God, we have sung it. Help us now, even as we leave this place, to mean it. That every moment of our days, we love your church. We love you, Lord. And we do what we do because we love you, not because of anything. Forgive. Forgive. That we come before your presence at the end of the day accountable to you. That we have given our best shot. Given our best. Lord, love you. Honor you. This moment, 30 seconds before God, before I close. Right from the beginning of this service to today, God is here in a worship. Everything I feel in. So today, I want to pray that all of you make a commitment to God wherever you are. 
at home or here to love the Lord always understand love Him love Him so Father in Jesus name we thank you for the eternal word of God that as we live by your word we will succeed and we will be blessed and we look forward Lord to the day when we look at Deuteronomy 28 when you said if you obey me all these blessings will flow So may the Lord bless you and keep you this day. May the Lord make His face always to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the good Lord turn His face towards you and your family and always grant you shalom. In Jesus' precious name, we pray and God's say aloud. Let's give God a good clap offering. Whoa! God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful week ahead of you.